He is an adjunct professor at Cal State Fullerton and an instructor at UCLA Extension's Writers Program, where he teaches the next generation of good storytellers. The Central Coast Writers Conference is very pleased to welcome Carl Iglesias. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm a screenwriter, and uh, you know public speaking, I've been doing it for 14 years, so I'm a little more uh, you know, confident about it, but when I first started, uh, I was terrified, because I just wanted to be you know, an introvert writer. Uh, and so I started doing, uh, I was one of the very first people at the Screen Learning Expo that was doing uh, keynotes on, 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 on uh, you know, PowerPoint, uh, because I wanted everybody to actually look at the screen <laughs> instead of me. And I thought I was a little more relaxed that way. Uh, so, uh, my presentations, uh, without sounding too uh, immodest, are super multimedia, funny, a lot of stuff happening real quick. If you like miss the screen for a second, you might miss something. So keep your eyes on the screen, okay? <laughs> you don't have to look at me, okay? So, uh, so how many people here are writers, uh, novelists, okay? How many people here are screenwriters, okay? Um, and how many of you want to be uh, great writers? Okay. How many people of you want to be mediocre writers? Okay. There's always a few in the room. All right. If you want to be great writers, stick around. Okay. So as I said, I'm a screenwriter. I'm actually semi-retired now. Uh, this is what my friends think I do. This is what my mom thinks I do. Partying with a Hollywood elite. This is what society thinks I do. This is what Hollywood producers think I do. This is what I, I think I do. And this is what I really do. Yeah, we're, we're all procrastinators. Um, uh, these are the two books that uh, was mentioned in my introduction. So the first one is the 101 Habits of How Successful Screenwriters. Uh, you may know this from a different cover. That's this, actually the 10th anniversary edition. Uh, and then the second one, Writing for Emotional Impact, which a lot of stuff we'll be talking about today uh, is in the book, and I believe both are on sale here. I'm a writer's instructor at the UCLA Writers Program, and I'm an adjunct professor at California State University in Fullerton. And I also teach uh, online at uh, Screenwriters University. Yes, there is such a thing. Uh, it's actually the online part of Writer's Digest, the Writer's Digest uh, empire. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about storytelling and the power of stories. And what time is it? It's almost nine o'clock. Um, there are, this is my, a picture of my office. And these are all the books that I read. These are all how-to books. And I actually, since I'm a you know, perfectionist, I actually counted all the single rules and principles that the, each teacher tells you to do. And there are 3,422. And I'd like to go through each one tonight. If I may. Terry, how long do we have the room for? Okay, so whenever anybody talks about uh, principles and rules, there's always an exception. Every time I say, oh, you need three x structure, yeah, well, what about Quentin Tarantino? Uh, you know, a character needs to change. Oh, what about James Bond? Um, you know, there's always, every single rule, all these rules have an exception. You'll always find a successful example of a rule that can be broken, but, there is one rule out of all these that can never, ever, ever be broken and that has never been broken in the history of storytelling. How many people here want to know what it is? <laughs> Just three or four? Okay, I won't tell you. Okay. Never mind, you're not interested. Okay. <laughs> I will tell you. I will tell you at the end of this uh, presentation. And this is uh, your first lesson in writing. <laughs> Anticipation, make him work. Or as William Goldman said, make him cry, make him, make him wait, make him cry, but above all, make him wait. Which is a valid, great lesson in uh, 
storytelling. Okay. There's this famous anecdote about two fish. It actually was shared in uh, a, a commencement address uh, by uh, Dave Foster Wallace a few years back. And he talks about these two fish, young fish who are swimming around. <coughs> and there's an older fish, wise mentor fish, comes up to them and says, Morning, boys. How's the water this morning? And just keeps swimming around. And then one of the young fish turns around to, this, to his friend and says, Wait, what else is water? Okay. Now, the point of the story is not that you know the why the old fish is this wise mentor thing. The point is is that sometimes the most important reality in our lives is the hardest to see or talk about. Okay. So we need to be the fish out of water. We need to go outside the water for a second, so be able to talk about stories for a second. And the reason I say this is because stories are, we're immersed in stories, just like fish are immersed in water. Okay? And, I'll, and I'll show that to you. So, I want you to take a moment to actually forget about everything you know about story, storytelling. Everything you see there, right? And realize the one truth about storytelling, which is, it's not about theories, it's about this. It's about emotional impact. Um, Doug was talking earlier about being compelling, right? That's what it's all about. And everything that I teach, everything that's in my book, Brain for Emotional Impact, is all about that. I'm focusing on the emotions that the audience feels, the emotions that every one of you craves, pays money for, spends tons of time Experiencing, because that's what it's about. So imagine you're the fish and everything else is surrounded by stories. And you don't even know it. Most, when people think about stories, they think about reading books, right? Think about, for a moment, how much time you spend reading books, how much time you spend going to the movies, watching TV, especially this trend now with Netflix and binging on a whole season <laughs> over the weekend. <laughs> I've done that, I can, I can get what that's about. It's really, there, there's something to it. I mean, Netflix was a kind of genius about this. Um, but when you think about storytelling, you don't think about how many conversations, for example. Think about how often you spend the day conversing with a friend or family. What you're doing is sharing stories about yourself, about your day, about others. Think about this. How much time do we spend online with social media? Too much, right? Yeah. But think about what you're doing. You're sharing stories. It's about storytelling. Think about joke telling, right? Jokes are stories. Gossip. <laughs> Right? For any uh, sports fans, or actually I should say for the <coughs> sports widows who do not understand what's the big fascination. Well, here's a big fascination, and I'm not a sports fan myself, but I can understand why it is. Sporting events are stories. You care for the characters you love. They have a goal. They have high stakes. They have a deadline. They have uncertainty, right? It's a story. It's structured. There's a payoff at the end. It's a happy ending or a sad ending at the end. Right? That's the power of sporting events. Uh, think about anybody who plays role-playing games or video games. Video games have gotten very, very story-driven, just like Hollywood uh, movies. And in fact, some, um, some games actually make more money on opening weekend you know, when they sell than an actual Hollywood blockbuster. Think about the news. The news are stories about people, about events, but mostly about people. Think about church on a Sunday, right? Parables, stories. If you think about your days in history classes, right? History is old stories. And when you're done, 
and you go to sleep at night, you dream. And these are stories too. So think about how much time you spend telling stories. It's amazing, isn't it? Why is that? From the beginning of time, beginning since we've had language, we've been telling stories, we've been immersed in stories, every single culture has had stories. And as a highly curious person who's always trying to understand why, as a matter of fact, why is my favorite word, um, I ask myself why that is. Why are stories such a big part of our lives? And this is something we're not thinking about because we're immersed in it, right? You didn't think about stories other than books or movies or TV, right? So why are they such a big part of our lives? Why are they shaped the way they are? Stories have a certain shape. Why do we prefer fiction over nonfiction? So there's a lot of studies uh, recently about, you know, our, our how we process stories at the brain level, and everybody, we process stories or we get the point of stories better when it's fiction than nonfiction. So there's something to them. And then of course, the million dollar question, because as a writer, this is really what I want to know, which is why some stories have this effect <laughs> on someone, and why other stories have this effect. <laughs> As writers, as professional writers, this is what we want to know, right? So I'm going to talk about that tonight. Some people may ask, why ask why? You know, if I love cheesecake, why do I need to know why I love cheesecake? Other than it feels good, right? Tastes great. Well, we kind of know that stories feel good, right? We know that stories are entertaining. If I ask someone, why do you love stories? Why do you go to the movies all the time? Why do you read books? Well, because they're great. They make me laugh, they make me cry, they make me feel good. I love it, it makes me feel great. And that's true. But the reason we need to ask why is because as writers, we are telling stories. We are writing stories. So we need to know what we're doing, in a sense. Or what's the purpose of stories. Because that's ultimately your purpose. Okay? Well, we'd like to know what, really what we're looking for. We're all here in this weekend, right? We're all trying to take classes. We're trying to learn about writing. You're here listening to me right now. And really what you're looking for, I'm sure, is that nugget, right? That one piece of information. What you guys want is this. Uh, computer, right? <laughs> Let's say you want to write an award-winning short story, you just push this key here. That's what we all want, we want that computer. And I'm really, really looking forward for that piece of software to come out, seriously. Um, yes. I really hope it'll be the greatest thing since Final Draft or, you know, Scrivener. Or anybody who knows Scrivener. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, that's what we want, but we know it's not that easy, right? There's this uh, great uh, story about an old man who walks into a piano store. And he sits at the piano, and he just gathers his composure. He puts his hand on the piano, and he starts playing. And it's the most awful thing you've ever heard. I mean, literally, cacophony, it's like dinner, like nothing, right? And he looks, his look on his face is like completely distraught. And the piano salesman comes up and says, can I, can I help you, what's going on? And the old man says, well, I, I just can't, I don't understand. I've been listening to Mozart for 30 years. <laughs> right, I've been listening to Mozart for 30 years, trying to play. Same thing with us, right? We've been, we grew up on stories, it's part of us. We understand stories, we recognize stories. We know when a story is great and when it's not. We know when it's, you know, when it's boring. And yet we're trying to write it and it's a lot more difficult than we think, isn't it? It's not as easy as pie. Because that's what we want, All right? So we need to go deeper. This is a great quote by Philip Pullman. After nourishing, a nourishment, sheltering, companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. <clears throat> so one of the reasons we crave them, according to him, and I agree, is that we need them. I'm gonna make this case tonight that stories actually have evolved, just like we have evolved as a human species, and that there's an evolutionary function to storytelling. Is this me? 
No? Okay, somebody else is wondering. Right. It better be Steven Spielberg. <laughs> okay. Um, so that stories serve this evolutionary purpose, which is to allow us to survive. You know, it's a bold statement to make. But scientists who are studying uh, stories and, our, and the effect on the brain, what happens on the brain on stories, uh, believe that without stories, we basically would be toast. We wouldn't exist as a species. Okay? And it's a pretty compelling case to make. Now think about it a little bit real quick, I'm gonna go through kind of the evolution of story very rapidly, it's just one slide each. So think about since the very first time we had language, right, and we started telling each other information, teaching each other, uh, which evolved into the cave paintings, the tablets, this is Homer's first screenplay. <laughs> um, the Bible, right? The Bible is stories, parables. Uh, the Greek myths, uh, fairy tales, theater, written language, written words, printed books, and then of course with the technology today, experiencing stories on mobile devices. So why do we crave stories so much? Right? And as I said before, the common answer is it, they feel good. Right? So that's an easy answer. But why do they feel good? So if they feel good, that means there's something going on, right? They, you know, just like eating a piece of cheesecake. There's something going on in the brain. So we're wired for stories. We're wired to enjoy them. But why is that? Okay. So stories entertain us. And here's an interesting thing about the word entertainment. Right? So we're all entertainers. It comes from the Latin root tenere. And tenere means to hold. How we get entertainment to hold? Well, it means to hold one's attention. Right? Stories are designed to hold our attention. And so I'm asking myself, well, why? Why do we need to hold our attention? Stories keep us engaged for a long time in order to achieve their power. Now, stories have a specific purpose in our lives. And in order to get that power on us, okay, we need to pay attention. So think about it for a minute, how much stuff is going on in our lives, right? We're constantly bombarded with things. We have a very short attention span, but I wouldn't blame that on, you know, iPhones and the internet. What you may not know is that our default state, when we're not thinking about anything, is to actually daydream. That is the default state of the brain. We actually, scientists have found that we have daydreams, about 2,000 daydreams a day, each of lasting about 14 seconds. Okay? So if you're not attending to anything, your brain is all over the place, just daydreaming. Okay? Now, how many people have read a book and on a bus or on a subway and missed their stop? Anyone? Just a few? I think we'll do a lot more. Maybe you're not reading good, good enough books. Um, so, want to know what happens when you actually read a good book and actually engrossed in a great story? How many daydreams you have? Zero. Okay? And Grumpy Cat here is not mad because it's zero. He's mad because he has to hold this stupid sign on three days. So, don't blame him. But, that's what stories do. So, remember that clip in Up, Pixar's Up, with Doug? That's like my favorite character, right? The dog, the dog, the dog, Doug. Um, here it is. He made me this color so that I may talk, squirrel! Okay. <laughs> Boy, that was the funniest moment, right? So, imagine we're Doug, that's what stories do, right? Story, that's what our brain Mother Nature has evolved us to do with stories, okay? So we pay attention. Now, stories, I'm gonna go real quick, what stories do that you have to pay attention for. So story powers to teach, right? We're constantly teaching. Um, here's what happens to, in your brain when you're actually processing data, okay? There's about just two pieces of the brain that are actually lit up, okay? 
And so what happens in that case is kind of up the board. Nothing much is happening in the brain, you're just processing data. Kind of like what's happening right now. I'm just giving you data, so I need to do something else. Okay, I just tell you a story. Um, so what stories are, I like to think that stories are kind of like this uh, sugar-coated pill, right? The pill that you give to a dog or a cat to eat, it's the medicine, right? Stories have the medicine and they're coated with sugar so that it feels good, so that you absorb it. That's what stories do, okay? So they allow you to process information. Uh, Ira Glass is a producer in This American Life, which is another storytelling uh, venue. Uh, narrative is a kind of backdoor to something very deep inside us, right? A backdoor into something deep. And this is when you think about myths or fairy tales, right? That's what they do. They just make it feel good, right? There's your brain on story. And this is what happens when you actually cross a story. This is your brain on stories, right? Think how much, seeing all the stuff that's lit up, that's actually processing. That's why it's feeling good. The lessons, of course, is that great stories teach us how to be human. They teach us about trust. They teach us about courage. They teach us about friendship and loyalty. They teach us about wisdom. And they teach us about love. Do you see a pattern here? Yes, Star Wars is my favorite movie. Uh, and it teaches about the power of good over evil, the battle between good over evil. Um, I like other movies. It teaches about hope. It teaches about prejudice. They also teach us what I call cautionary tales. They teach you what not to do. Right? They show you, okay, if you choose, you know, yes, there's loyalty to family, but if you choose to be a monster, you're selling your soul to the devil. Or they're teaching you not to have an affair. <laughs> or else somebody's going to cook your rabbit. <laughs> Alright, stories also solve problems and heal. There's actually a branch of psychotherapy that uses books and stories to heal problems. Right? I've actually seen one I should do for kids, but they also do it for adults too. I saw a book where they have all these uh, common psychological issues and disorders, and, and there's actually a list of books, uh, you know, fiction books, that actually deal with those problems and show you how to heal. And the same with cinema, too, with movies. So it's kind of like, you know, go see this movie and call me in the morning. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the 12 style programs, right? Uh, like Alcoholics Anonymous, where people share their stories. Uh, and from listening to other people's stories, you uh, uh, start, um, you know, solving yours. Uh, stories have the power to shape beliefs and morality. Uh, this is a clip from the famous 1984 uh, Apple uh, ad, right? Which look at Apple today. Um, the movie Sideways. In 2005, before 2005, Merlot used to be the highest selling red wine. <laughs> All you needed was Paul Giamatti to diss, uh, you know, to snub Merlot and say Pinot Noir was better. And guess what happens to the sales? So this is a movie affecting economic reality. Um, the book Uncle Tom's Cabin is said to have started the Civil War. Um, and you can also have the opposite effect too which is uh, Birth of a Nation, which actually inflamed racism and kind of resurrected the, uh, the KKK. So stories are all about morality plays, really. And a lot of people start thinking, you know, they start being afraid that, you know, stories turn youngsters into juvenile delinquents. Um, they're afraid of what stories do. And that's why you have book burnings. Um, but when you really think about stories, I think stories are highly moralistic. I think most, probably 99.99% of stories that feature crime, the end conclusion is that crime doesn't pay. You know? Even with a character like in Breaking Bad that we connect with, uh, pays the price at the end of the series. 
Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> One of the great things that stories, uh, stories do is the power to create meaning and to take anything that's chaotic that's not related and trying to shape it into something that makes sense. This is how we learn. Uh, it is said that we cannot survive longer than 40 days without food or three days without water. We cannot survive more than 30 seconds without meaning. Uh, a couple of, was it a week ago or two weeks ago, the uh, reporters shooting, right? I remember uh, watching CNN that day, and it was constantly about why, until they found out why. That's all they focused on, is why. Because it was such a senseless, chaotic event. And everybody wanted to know why. That's what our brains do. We're constantly trying to go from chaos to coherence, from confusion to clarity, from this moment of what happened to, aha, I get it. To understand so that we can survive and control things. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a little part of your brain, left, her left hemisphere, that's labeled the interpreter, that actually that's their, its sole purpose is to interpret things. So I'm gonna show you this in action a little bit right now. I'm gonna give you three, I'm gonna say they're unrelated, and they are, they're unrelated uh, sentences, and I'm gonna put them in order here. He went to the store, Fred died, Sharon went hungry and wept, okay? And I'm willing to bet that most of you, as you're reading this, in order, in that order, think that he refers to Fred, that Fred died when he went to the store, or at the store, that Fred went to get food for Sharon, that Sharon is related to Fred, that she cried because he died. What else can we infer? That the store is a grocery <coughs> store. Isn't that amazing? Right? Your brain naturally does this. Why? Because it craves this. Okay? It craves order out of incoherence. And if you see, I'm sure people have seen this, this is on Mars. There's a whole conspiracy theory about this. Right? Many people see the face, right? Everybody sees the face in that. And the Rorschach test, right? Which is designed to see what meaning you see out of irrelevant shapes. Clouds. And the Virgin Mary on a piece of toast. This is going to shock you. And even more shocking is that the piece of toast was 10, 10 years old when it sold. Even. So this person kept it for 10 years. And somebody was crazy enough to pay that much money. It's amazing, isn't it? So stories, stories create meaning. And, because, and we crave that. Now, here's the thing. As writers, this is very important because every single thing you're going to write will have meaning, but it may not be the meaning that you intended, right? Here's a little clip you might enjoy. A toy Story, it's a meditation on the trials of puberty and sexuality. Uh, Andy has a um, Woody who comes to life whenever his mother goes out. However, all is not quite what it seems because uh, Woody is in fact uh, limp and ineffectual particularly around Bo Peep, uh, showing his sexual inadequacies. Um, so, suddenly, Buzz appears. He is a shiny, 10-inch, battery-operated toy. And he is guaranteed to take Bo Peep and anyone else who comes along to infinity and beyond. It's really fun about him, despite being occasionally limp and unresponsive. Uh, what men do provide is variety. Uh, they're not uh, going to be giving you the same thing over and over again, like Buzz Lightyear is, basically. <laughs> no, 
Now, the funny thing about this is that that's exactly what I thought when I saw Toy Story. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Moving along, uh, stories have this power, and this is also very important. It's, I think it's, it's a huge part of our lives, or the, the lessons that we need to learn, uh, which is it makes us more social. Uh, there are studies out there. Now, we are uh, social animals. Um, this is the reason why there are sidewalk cafes, and reality shows galore, and gossip magazines, and we gossip about 65% of our conversations. We constantly are obsessed with other people. And there's a reason for that. So, um, a couple of hundred thousand years ago, when we developed intelligence, we really quickly realized that two heads are better than one. And that we could help each other to survive. And even if it's a whole society, even better. And that's how we evolve. We evolve to social uh, beings um, because that's how we survived. Okay? And eventually we learn deep down that we're all the same. Okay? It's all about evolution. Right? Eat, survive, reproduce. And even though we, we don't know what it's about, yeah. when you really get into you know, evolutionary, biology, psychology, neuro, every single field now is focusing on evolution uh, to get answers. And it's really, really fascinating. Um, and that's what stories do, ultimately. This is a great clip here uh, about what happens in your blood while you're watching a story. And there's actually a cool story there, and I'll talk about it in a second. It's from, uh, you can find this out online, uh, Future of Storytelling, and then the researcher's name is uh, Paul uh, Zach. So check this out. I want to tell you a story about a little boy named Ben. Ben is two and a half years old, and Ben has brain cancer. And Ben's really happy. He's happy because he's been through two rounds of chemo and radiation, and he feels good for once. He doesn't feel yucky, and his father's enjoying seeing Ben's happiness. As the father tells the story of Ben and his cancer, the father's voice begins to break. And he says, you know, it's very difficult to play with Ben because Ben thinks everything is wonderful, but I know something that Ben doesn't, that Ben's dying. And he talks about how difficult it is to play with Ben, knowing that in three or six months, Ben will be dead. And yet Ben is so happy, he's so beautiful. And so the father tries as hard as he can to enjoy Ben, to be joyful around Ben, but then he says in the middle of this short story that it's an amazing thing to know how little time one has left. And as he says that statement, he has merged himself with his son. It's as if the father himself is dying. So in my laboratory, we've studied this story extensively. What we found is that two primary emotions were elicited. One is distress and the other is empathy. At the same time, when we asked people what they felt after the story was over, we really couldn't get very clear answers. So we began doing other studies on this story. So we took blood before and after, and we found that the brain produced two interesting chemicals. One is called cortisol, which focuses our attention on something important. So cortisol correlated with our sense of distress. So the more distress you felt, the more cortisol you released, and the more you paid attention to that stimulus. The second chemical release is called oxytocin, which is associated with care and connection and empathy. And oxytocin was correlated with people's sense of empathy. And the more oxytocin they released, the more empathic they felt towards Ben and his father. All right. Isn't that interesting? So cortisol and oxytocin. And cortisol focuses you and makes you pay attention to what's really important. Oxytocin connects you, makes you more empathetic so that you become more social, okay? And uh, stories actually have shown that people who read fiction tend to be more empathetic. Empathy actually rises after you read uh, fiction. Um, as Frank Capra once said, the whole thing is you've got to make them care about somebody. That's a lesson for the last writers. We've got to make the audience care and connect emotionally with that character. 
Here's another great clip. This is a, a award-winning uh, commercial by uh, Spike Jones, the director. Um, I want you to pay attention to the lamp as we watch this. survival as a species uh, and so what stories do is they simulate life right so people think well you know art imitates life but it's a little deeper than this uh, so it's the kind of the evolutionary logic behind this so learning comes from experience okay uh, experience comes from bad decisions right but bad decisions could be fatal right? so Stories kind of allow us to kind of go through those decisions and that experience safely, okay? Because in the Stone Age time, if you saw this, you kind of didn't really have time, or actually it would be fatal to experience, well, I wonder what would happen if the lion just jumped at me, right? You'd be toast, I'd be dead, right? But if you're watching a story this now, I'll, I'll talk about this in a, in a minute about mirror neurons, which is another fascinating thing. Uh, you're able to experience that safely and learn the lessons without getting hurt. Now, some of you may think, well, what about today? Modern days, we don't have to deal with lions anymore. That's true. But we have to deal about more other complex situations, <laughs> like social skills, right? Marriages relationships, and that's what stories do. Horror films, of course, are built on this, right? The reason we enjoy horror films was we're able to experience something that would be fatal if it was in real life, but you kind of, your brain kind of knows at the same time that you're sitting in the theater and you're safe, okay? But here's the thing, in order for you to kind of like absorb the lessons, the character has to suffer, okay? In other words, we never learn anything if things are going well. We only learn from experience when things are going bad. So characters need to suffer and go through problems and resolve these problems in order for us to learn, okay? Finally, stories have the power to make us feel alive. And this is different from the enjoyment part of it, the, the laughter and the crying. We live our lives in autopilot. Most of our lives are kind of like, goes by, we don't even think about it. Um, scientists have studied how long or how often do we feel truly, truly alive. And it's about three minutes a day. Right? We go through this kind of autopilot, we go through life, kind of a neutral, almost. We're only experiencing true joy, true feelings, about three minutes a day. 
when we see a starry night or in the arms of a loved one, when we see happiness in a child's face. And that's because of the single mirror neurons. Now, how many people here know about mirror neurons? I'm trying to see how it's pretty. Is there anybody who doesn't know? Let's know real quick. Okay. Uh, so, a town scientist that discovered this quite by accident. Uh, they were studying monkeys, and they were, they were looking at the scans of the brain, and they found out what was happening when a monkey was grabbing a banana, and they, they looked at the brain scans. Then they also did the brain scans of when the monkey was watching another monkey grab a banana, and it was the exact same firings. In other words, the brains do not know what's real, what's imagined. And that is the power of stories. Right? That's the power of the simulation. You're able to experience something as if it's happening to you, physically, literally. Okay? And that's why it's enjoyable. Physically, you're feeling, not the actual punches, but you're feeling the adrenaline going through as James Bond is battling a villain on the train. You are experiencing the sadness of a boy, old yeller, the dog is dying. You're experiencing a kiss in your brain. Check out this clip here. Um, this is actually from a trailer for a horror film. And the marketing department had the brilliant idea of showing what the audience is going through. Like actually uh, the you know, camera on the audience. Pay attention to the audience. Uh, the, the sound is turned off on this one. Look at the audience. <laughs> Okay? <laughs> now these are actual physical reaction, and most of them are, you know, protecting your, your vital organs. <laughs> right? That's your brain reacting to a horror film. Right? That is the power of neurons. Now, um, how many people here read romance novels? Okay. How many people do but don't want to tell me? Okay. How many people read them on Kindles? Um, a little word of caution for romance readers, and this is true, this is what your brain releases as you read a romance novel. Adrenaline, which is that fight or flight feeling, very tense. Dopamine, which is kind of like a feel-good chemical, which is supposed to be for attention, right? You're paying attention to what's going on. Endorphins, which I just found out means endogenous morphine. That means morphine, it's equal to morphine inside your body. That's what endogenous means, right? So your, your brain is actually producing morphine, okay? Uh, oxytocin, right? You all know oxytocin is that social bonding chemical. And phenylalanine, which is uh, what you get from sex, from eating chocolate, or from taking ecstasy. <laughs> so needless to say, right? Uh, they're highly addictive, <laughs> literally, literally, okay? Uh, and this is probably why romance novels are the highest selling genre in publishing, from what I hear. So watch out. But that's what stories in general feel good. So that is the power of stories. Um, stories are powerful in our lives. They hold our attention in order to teach us how to live how to be human, and how to get along with others. So can you imagine what would happen if we didn't have stories, right? I don't think we would survive. So again, why is this important? And again, because you are writers and you are telling stories, your story better be on purpose. Since you know what the purpose of stories are, your story, you have to think about that. So you have to think, well, what is your purpose as a storyteller? Because that's what stories are supposed to do. And if they're not doing that, the audience kind of feels something is missing. They're not really, if, it, if you, for example, your story does, you know, you're not doing anything to make them pay attention, if you're not grabbing them, then you're missing your, your point, right? So, how do we tell a good story? Alcohol helps. <laughs> All right, so stories are kind of hard to define. We kind of know stories, but when we try to define them, 
Uh, it's a little difficult. Uh, when you ask people, well, what's a story? That's what you get, right? A series of events, something that happened, right? Something with a beginning, middle, and an end. Uh, well, everything has a beginning, middle, and an end, so that doesn't help. The dictionary says, any report of connecting events, actual or imaginary, presented in a sequence of written or spoken words, or still moving images, right? So it's a series of connecting events. And when you think about it, most definitions revolve around plot. And this is the reason why everybody's kind of obsessed with plot. If you look at the how-to books, right, more than half have the word plot in the title, right? That's what you, people think that that's what people are worried about because it's hard to come up with one, but that's not what audiences are there for. We're not looking for plot, right? Okay? Story is an emotional process that connects us with each other. Okay? So if I said to you, for example, I brushed my teeth this morning and went to work, you'd look at me like, uh, okay, so what's your point, right? You're waiting for that connection. And the reason you go so is because that didn't connect with you, right? Now, why do you think that is? Because it didn't really teach you anything, right? There's nothing to it, right? It's just a series of events, it's just plot. Right? But imagine I told you this. I just got mugged on the elevator. Suddenly you're paying attention. Right? Why? Because suddenly now it's about you. Why is it about you? Because you want to know what would happen to you if you got out there. Maybe the maybe the, you know the person is still out there, maybe they're gonna mug you. Right? So suddenly you're paying attention. Now the difference between the two is that one really is about a problem. That's it. everybody knows, right? About conflict. Stories are about problems. So a character with a problem, a struggle, high stakes in the resolution, we're getting closer to kind of like a definition here. Let me, uh, this is actually the second half of that clip you saw about the uh, cortisol and the, and the uh, oxytocin. Further, we use functional brain imaging to identify the regions of the brain that were most active while watching that video compared to a control video in which Ben and his father are at the zoo. And we found was that the most active areas for the emotional story were areas of the brain associated with theory of mind or understanding of what others are doing and areas that are rich in oxytocin receptors that make us feel empathy. And guess what happens when you watch 100 seconds of a father and son at the zoo? Nothing happens and people just blank out. There's no reason for them to attend to this information because nothing's happening. There's nothing exciting. Okay, there's a valuable lesson for our storytellers, right? When nothing is happening, and believe me, I see that a lot in consulting and my students, when nothing is happening, you're just bored because nothing's happening. Nothing's happening in your brain because there's no reason for you to pay attention to it. Yeah. So let's go a little deeper because that's what we're going to get at, right? We're going to keep bringing this up. That should be implanted in your memory. That's your audience. So, um, you guys remember Doug's last words in the panel about being compelling? Right? That's what it's about. So, compelling, the definition of compelling is you cannot take your eyes off it. You're paying attention. So, compelling characters is a good start. Okay? Next thing, right, everybody, hopefully everybody knows this, right? You want a desire line in your story, right? Because we're all creatures of desire. We want something. And a good way to know what to want is to look at this, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, because those are our needs as human beings. And since we connect with human beings, that's what you want your characters to want too. When you think about the great stories out there, they're all about this, they're all in there. Okay. Now, this, uh, this slide needs to be updated for today's time. Uh, Sidney Pollack said, nothing can happen until somebody wants something. Okay, so keep that in mind. So you have character and goal, and then you need another part of the equation, which is trouble. 
right? Trouble is nature's way of making sure you pay attention to what's going on, okay? To the lesson, to the nugget. All right, Strama 101, a great definition is conflict is not getting what you want. Okay, it's a great definition for scene writing too. If you're writing a scene, a lot of the times what's missing what's in the scene is a goal, character with a goal. You don't have character reacting to things or character arguing with something. They're just, we don't know what the goal is, right? Mary desperately wanted some ice cream, so she went to the kitchen and got some. Is this a compelling story? Yes? <laughs> Did I hear a yes there? Wow, I like to read your writing. <laughs> so, right, it's not compelling. Why? Because it was just too easy, right? There's no conflict, there's no opposition. Right? That's not a story. You could people get bored reading that, okay? Uh, lack of conflict. Now, it is the most common thing I see, which is very, very um, kind of puzzling because it is the most commonly taught thing, right? It's like drama 101. Uh, lack of conflict is the most common flaw there is, and I'm trying to figure out why. And I think I, I came up with like three reasons. The first one is that, okay, you have beginners, they just don't know the craft, they need to study the craft, and that's fine, just keep studying the craft uh, and you'll get it. Uh, the second reason I think is that we tend to avoid it in real life. We tend to avoid conflict in real life. This is an interesting paradox here, right? As writers, you want to create as much conflict and make your character suffer, right? But in real life, we try to avoid conflict, right? And most of our lives, especially in modern day, we just go on through life with barely any conflict, okay? So we're not experienced with it. And that's kind of difficult to write about or to think about, right? And so what happens, is that, right, you have writers writing about real life, and so they say, well, this is real life. There's no conflict in real life, okay? This is a very common thing I see all the time in students. So me, there's no conflict here. Students, yeah, but this really happened, right? I get this all the time. It really happened, okay? And I say, well, I don't care, it doesn't work, okay? And then I always bring out my favorite Alfred Hitchcock quote, Right, which is, it's real life with all the boring parts cut out. There's a third reason, and this is a little more understanding, understandable, which is you don't want your beloved characters to suffer. Okay? And I can understand this, right? You love your characters, just like you love your friends. You don't want them to suffer because you are suffering. You're empathetic. Okay? But remember, again, if you want your story to connect with the reader, the audience, right, and do what it's supposed to do, your characters need to suffer. You don't have a story until something goes wrong, and that's because we're programmed to pay attention to negative things in order to survive. So again, this is the evolutionary function of stories. We're, we're programmed to pay attention to negative things. If things are happy, there's no reason for us to pay attention to it. You saw that with the, the clip, right? Ben and his father at the zoo. Nothing's happening, it's happy. Um, my colleague at UCLA, Richard Walter, who's the, the head of the screener department, likes to write as a feedback to students uh, in their script whenever he sees a scene where people are polite with each other, when they're happy with each other, when they're agreeing with each other, and he writes, village of the happy people. <laughs> and his point is that nobody goes to the movies to see the village of the happy people. Okay, so it's a good note. And this is actually the reason why we don't see stories about going to the bathroom, <laughs> or eating lunch, or making coffee, right? You see stories about big problems. All right. You need an active struggle. Now the key word here, so you don't need struggle, right? You need conflict. Uh, you need the character to be actively pursuing their goal. And the reason I say that is because I, I see a lot of flawed stories where the characters are passive. Where the conflict happens to them, which is fine up to a certain point, but you don't want to make it the whole thing. At some point, the character actively has to struggle to get what they want, okay? 
And a perfect example of this is The Fugitive with Harrison Ford. Um, you know, he's always on, he's on the run, right? Being unjustly accused of a murder, but what the, the spine of the story is him actively solving the mystery, right? If it was just him running away from Gerard the whole time, it would be boring after a while, okay? It would be passive conflict as opposed to active conflict. Uh, this is a great quote from John Gardner, novelist. He said, failure to recognize that the central character must act, not simply be acted upon, is the single most common mistake of beginners. Okay? So very important, make sure that your character acts as opposed to being acted upon. All right, moving on, your story needs a little forward movement. And what I mean by that is the sense of that you're on the road, moving forward, as opposed to being static, okay? And that's anticipation, all right? When you anticipate something, when you have a goal, uh, you're looking forward to either being achieved or not achieved, and because there's conflict, you also have tension and suspense. Now, one of the most effective anticipation techniques, this is the only one I'm gonna talk about because it's really great, and it's really the most effective, you see this all the time, and that's what I call reader superior position or dramatic irony, which is when the audience knows something that the character doesn't, okay? So let me show you a little example here. So uh, you look at the scene, right? So they're all happy. And if you pan to the right a little bit, <laughs> you get an effect. It says, this will not end well. Yeah. At the bottom. Like ninja guy coming home from work. And you see all the weapons on the right there? Yeah. Right? You're, you're, you're suddenly anticipating what's about to happen. Now, the interesting thing about this is that uh, when scientists are studying what happens to your brain, your brain is releasing a lot more dopamine, which is kind of like the reward drug, uh, from the anticipation than the actual event happening. Okay? And by the way, Las Vegas is built on that, right? They managed to know that it's really on the, the anticipation of the reward that drives people, not the actual reward. Uh, and there's a great story uh, about James Cameron, who was pitching uh, Titanic, and most of the executives just didn't get it. They were saying, well, this movie is not going to work because we all know the ending. We know the boat sinks, so who's gonna be interested in that movie, right? And he, of course, knew that that's exactly the point. Right? It's because we know that the boat is going to sink, that we have dramatic irony, and we're going to be constantly worried and paying attention to the couple, right? And feeling all this oxytocin from the love scenes, and all the, you know, the, the cortisol from the distress, and we're going to have a great time, and of course James Cameron is laughing all the way to the bank. Alright, we're almost done. Uh, transformation. So this is about change. Now, the, the, the whole purpose of a story is to teach you something, right? And so if nothing changes in the story, there's no effect, there's no lesson. Um, stories are not about plot. As counterintuitive as it sounds, they're about how the characters react to the plot and change as a result. Uh, there's this great, great quote by Charles Darwin. Um, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, no, the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. Right? Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Right? And those who are able to change and adapt, right? It's about adaptation, we're able to survive. Right? And if you think about greatest stories, right? You have main character who changes. Yeah. Right? You have Rick Blaine. Yeah, Tom Cruise changes from you know selfish, self-centered uh, oh, yeah. to caring for his brother. Tutsi, who learns how to be a better man, dressed as a woman, <laughs> right? And that's really what we crave in the story, because that's where the nugget of information is. That's where the lesson is. It's at the focal point of the story where the character changes. Right? When they got the epiphany, or when they do something that shows how they change, which are called the noble choice. That's where we get the lesson. Now the thing is that because change is hard in real life, 
Uh, the best stories are really about a character who summons their courage to change. Okay? Those to me are the best stories. It's a little more realistic because change is hard. There's this great quote here by George Lucas. It's a little, it's a little long, so I'm going to actually read it to you. He was talking about his movies, right? Now, like, there's three different movies here. One is a kind of a futuristic dystopia. You got American Graffiti, Star Wars. Couldn't be any different. But in this quote, he says in this conversation that all my movies have all been about the same thing. They've all been the same story, which I thought was surprising. You're a prisoner of your own mind, but the door is open. All you have to do is walk out. It's about making the decision to try something completely new and go out into the world and live real life. You just have to jump out there and do it. You can't let fear stop you. Right? When you think about that, it makes, right? Movies are all about that. It's about not letting fear stop you and changing. Um, and isn't that our story as a human species when you think about it, right? If we didn't have that sense, that courage, or that sense of adventure, we'd all be still stuck in the cave somewhere, right? All right, finally, you want resolution in your story. You want an end date. Because again, that's also where the epiphany is, that's also where the lesson is. Uh, another great quote, this is from Lindsay Durant, who's a pr uh, great producer in Hollywood. She said, um, she actually had a great, uh, uh, I got this from the, the talk, TED talk that she did. So if you look it up online, just uh, plug in her name. Actually, I think it's Doran. I think I misspelled it. I'm sorry. It's D-O-R-A-N. But she talks about uh, endings in movie and what we really look for in endings. And what she thinks, like, you know, what makes an audience happy is not the moment of victory, but the moment afterwards when the winners share the victory with somebody they love. When you think about it, right, she talks about Rocky, for example. Most people think that Rocky wins the fight at the end, but he doesn't. He loses the fight. But the moment afterwards is when he actually says, Yo, Adrian, Adrian, I love you, and they embrace, right? And if you think about movies like Die Hard, for example, right? He's after the terrorist, but really what he's looking for is to reconnect with his wife, and that is the moment, right? The movie doesn't end when the villain falls to his death. It ends right afterwards when you have the relationships and the, and the resolution of the relationships. Uh, same with Rocky, as I just mentioned. And of course, everybody remembers the ending of Casablanca. Right? It's not when he says goodbye to her, it's when, my nose? Right, beginning of a beautiful friendship, right, with uh, Renault. So it's about the relationships, guys. Only connect. And I want to show you a one minute clip here. It's a commercial. That's the reason I show you those because they're one minute and they tell great stories. Um, just enjoy. Action, right? Um, but this just was brilliantly done. So, uh, reviewing here, real quick, and in light of this story you just saw, okay, do we have a compelling character? Okay, aren't you focused on what the character is doing? Yeah. Right? You're invested in that character. You already connect and root for them because it's about getting the girl. Right? We relate to that. We empathize. 
We follow them, it's compelling, we're paying attention. Is there a desire line? Right? Of course. Is there trouble? Meaning, is it difficult? Is the goal difficult? Right? You saw everything you had to do, right? Relationships are not that easy, right? Getting the girls not that easy. Um, is there an active struggle? Right? Characters actively pursuing it. Is there forward movement? Right? We see the whole story. Is there transformation? Heck yes, right? He's getting married and he's getting a kid. Right? And is there resolution? Of course. Okay, so there you go. Great story being told. Uh, is there satisfaction? Oh, yes. Okay, so uh, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, I actually, uh, when I did a, a dry run, so this, this part here about emotions, this is what I focus on in my teaching. And uh, yesterday I actually did a dry run with uh, friends and family, and that went for another hour. <laughs> so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through this. I actually delete all those slides, but uh, this is a very important thing I want to leave you with, which is, okay, so you, you know how to tell a good story, but you still need to maintain that engagement with the audience, okay? And so, as storytellers, you have to know we're really in the emotion delivery business, right? Hollywood kind of prepackages TV shows, movies, you know, it's all about the emotion that you feel. If you're feeling like laughing and you go into a comedy movie and you haven't laughed a single Time, you're not going to say this was a great movie, right? You'd be bored. Uh, so it's really about the emotions of the audience. And <clears throat> when I first started teaching this, um, a lot of students were confused because they thought that it's really about the character emotions, how to create character emotions, how to make somebody cry, for example. And that's not what I was teaching. I was teaching about the audience emotions. It's quite a difference. So I'll give you an example. If somebody, if you watch somebody walking and they suddenly slip on a banana peel. Right? We laugh. Right? It's a cliche comedy bit. Right? What happens, to, but what is the character feeling? Pain. Right? Pain, embarrassment, yeah. anger, right? Two different emotions. Um, do you guys remember the opening of Jaws? Mm -hmm. Right? So you have this uh, beautiful woman, she's naked, she's, she's swimming peacefully in the ocean. Right? What is she feeling, emotion wise? Happiness, Happiness joy, relaxation. Right? Suddenly we hear, totem. <laughs> what do we feel as an audience? <laughs> Tension, right? Cortisol is pumping through our brain at this point. Right? So two different things. Um, this was actually validated by Frank Capra. Right? I made mistakes in drama. I thought drama was when the actors cried, but drama is when the audience cries. Right? So... I wanted to leave you with those emotions, uh, not to, I'm not going to go through each one. Um, if you come to my uh, Pixar seminar, uh, there'll be a little more detail on that. Those will do that very well, but I just wanted to give you kind of a rundown real quick. So curiosity is one of them, uh, which is the question that the audience gets, what will happen next, which is the absolute best feeling you want an audience to feel. Uh, empathy, of course, right? The oxytocin, connecting with character. Anticipation which is about holding our attention. Uh, tension and suspense, which is about uncertainty. Uh, and those actually, the uncertainty is what get us, uh, gets the highest level of dopamines above anything else. And that's why suspense is such a great um, uh, emotion to feel for an audience. Uh, surprise, which is unexpected anticipation. Uh, and of course, insight, which is the whole purpose of your story, okay? It's point, it's meaning, and it feels good when we finally get it. Uh, my Angelou said, people will never forget what you told them. Uh, people will forget what you told them. They will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Okay. So, do you guys remember this? Yes, you guys are ready. There's only one thing that can never ever be broken. You probably already guessed what it is. That's the rule. There has never, in the history of storytelling, that has never ever been broken. Or maybe it has, it just hasn't been a successful story. Right? Because again, it's about this. So finally I want to leave you with a couple of things. One is this, one of my favorite quotes. 
which is R equals far plus algebra. It's not supposed to be funny. <laughs> um, it's supposed to be deep and meaningful and inspiring. <laughs> What's going on? Must be must be past ten. Yes. Um, okay. No. So what I was going to say about that is because you know you guys are all here tonight. You're going to be here this weekend. You're going to be getting a lot of algebra this weekend. Right? Everybody's going to be talking about theory and principles and what to do and what not to do. You know, I kind of I did that too, but that's the algebra. This is the only thing we can teach you, but you still need to bring the fire to the equation in order to make great art. The fire is you guys. The fire is your creativity. The fire is your inspiration. What you want to say? What is it you want to say? What is the purpose of your story? Um, so, I hope you'll make great art. Afterwards, uh, I'm gonna leave you with one last clip, which kind of, you know, encompasses everything I just said. Hopefully, in one little minute again. <laughs> Thank you very much.